Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our weekly webinar um, series on parasites. Today, our weekly webinar will be um, presented by Dr. Nikki Whitley from Fort Valley State University. And she will be presenting on um, grazing away parasites. So our weekly webinar is put together by um, Delaware State University, so Kwame Matthews, myself, Dr. Daly O'Brien from Virginia State University, and Susan Chanian from University of Maryland College Park. Okay, thank you. All right, so when we talk about parasite control, we're mostly talking about internal parasites, and those are the primary health issue that we see for goats and sheep, especially in the southeast. It may be different in some other parts, but worms are everywhere. Even in Canada, we see homunculus or the barber pole worm, which is our worst one. And we know that goats and sheep are the most susceptible farm livestock to worms. And because worms are becoming immune or resistant to our dewormers, then we need to use different methods for parasite control. The main worm that causes us problems is the barber pole worm. So the barber pole worm is the one that sucks blood and can cause anemia or blood loss. And so that's what we're seeing here on this picture, very pale mucous membranes that are indicative of anemia. This is a picture of barber pole worms in a, the stomach of a goat, very pale stomach, and a lot of these barber pole worms that are, are sucking blood that may cause weight loss. They do not cause diarrhea. And they cause weight loss mostly because the animal doesn't graze. The animal loses energy, lays around, doesn't eat, um, doesn't graze. There are other worms that we have to be aware of for small ruminants, both stomach and intestinal worms that do cause weight loss for, for doing. In other words, they just don't look right. Rough hair coat, diarrhea, those kind of things. And then we have tapeworms, which are the only ones that we can really see in the feces. Again, all of these are passed through pasture, so are a concern when we are grazing animals. We have liver fluke and Deer worm or meningeal worm that are a concern when we have pastures that are in wet areas because they have an indirect life cycle. So they are passed through not only primary host but also through a snail. And so controlling snails or slugs on your pastures would be a concern with these. If you are in an area <clears throat> that you have this problem, liver fluke is found mostly in the Gulf Coast area of the U.S. Also, we have deer worm or meningeal worm that if we control our deer then we can also help control this worm so controlling deer may not be as easy as controlling snails or slugs on your pasture you can fence out uh, areas where there's wet wet um, pastures to help with that you can have livestock guardian dogs may help with deer control. Coccidia is also an internal parasite. And although it's mostly a parasite that we think of when, when we have animals inside, you can also have coccidia problems when animals are housed on pasture. So areas in which the animals congregate and graze low to the ground and close to feces is gonna cause problems not only for gastrointestinal nematodes or worms, but also for coccidia, which are not worms and have a different treatment. So underneath shade areas where they may hang out around waters where it may be wet and they hang out around the water, those can be places where they may pick up coccidia. The treatment is chorid or sulfa drugs and some of those are prescription. You can prevent those with coccidia stats in the feed, but we need to make sure we read labels so we don't kill our donkeys or horses because the some of the coccidia stats, I think it's remits in, is labeled not to feed to equids. And there are some treatments at the bottom, but again, that'll be for another presentation. So what we're going to talk about is those things that are related to pasture management, and those are listed here in bold that we're going to go through 
for this presentation. So the barber, barber pole worm life cycle. So understanding specifically the barber pole worm, but a lot of the worms that we're gonna have problems with are gonna have a, a direct life cycle like this. So the eggs hatch and grow inside the manure to uh, infective larva, which comes out in the manure, can migrate up the grass in dew um, or raindrops and the goats or the sheep eat that grass with the infective larva on it. They go into the stomach or the abomasum. The L3 mature. The L4 goes into the abomasal lining, so the stomach lining, and does suck blood and can actually go dormant. So it doesn't lay eggs. It can go dormant and last in the animal up to six months. Then it'll mature when the timing is right. If it's not in hyperbiosis, then they will mature into adults. Then the adults breed in the animal. They lay eggs, the eggs exit the animal in the feces and the cycle starts back over. So the L1 and the L2 stages are actually in the manure pellet and the L3 is the one that comes out. The L3 can actually live a long time on the ground because it has a, a tough outer coating. So understanding the animals that get worms the easiest helps us to manage those animals on, on pasture better. So we know that, that animals under stress, young growing animals just before and after giving birth, um, those times are when the animals are most likely to get worms. And then we have mature animals, dry animals that are not milking. If they're not pregnant or they're early pregnant, if they're really well fed or, you know, they're pets because we usually feed our pets really well. And then there's some breeds or adapted animals that are less likely to get worms. If we understand this, then we can manage those animals and the pastures that we put them on based on that susceptibility. So we can put our more susceptible animals on our best pastures, our cleanest pastures first, follow those with resistant animals um, or use resistant animals to clean up those pastures after those more susceptible animals. Some basic management we wanna consider so if you're gonna feed them, make sure you're using feeders when you have them on pasture. We want to have clean water. We don't wanna overgraze. And in that case, if you remember from last week, the parasites migrate up the first two to four inches and most of them in the first two to three inches of the forage. And so we want to make sure we don't graze too low. If you over overgraze or if you overstock, your pastures, then you're going to graze lower to the ground and the animals are going to be more likely to pick up a infection. We want to look at things like time birthing to minimize parasite infections. When we look at basic management of our pastures or forages, when we look at the life cycle of the worm, the larva hatch out and can become infective in three to four days. So if we rotate every one to three days, at the most every, every three to four days, but generally in our pasture management, best management practices fact sheet, the recommendation is every one to three days. And this is like management intensive grazing. So you put quite a few animals on a, on a small plot, but move them very often. If you do that, they're less likely to pick up infective larva. The key to rotations is you actually don't want the animals to come back to an old pasture for at least two months, if possible. Two to three months is plenty of time in most parts of the world, even though we did say that the Homunculus contortus L3 can live for up to six months on pasture. If you can't rotate or wait that long, then you can wait and base that move on forage height so it's greater than four to six inches. So again, looking at the height helps us to control those larvae, but as plant forage height goes up, the maturity of the plant goes up and the nutritive quality goes down in that plant. So you have to balance your rotations so you don't want it to get 
overly mature because then you can have problems nutritionally because of forage quality. We can also create clean pastures. So some clean pastures include new pastures, so freshly planted pastures shown here in this picture, some that are rotated with crops and therefore they are, are tilled and basically new, annual pastures, if you have crops and plant annuals, those are clean pastures. You can burn off dormant pastures and when the pastures are dormant, for example, burning off Bermuda or Bahia grass pastures in the wintertime. And possibly if you cut for hay, a hay field is generally thought of as fairly clean, but it depends on if you cut it and it's really dried out and there's no biomass keeping the soil area moist to allow for the parasites to to live longer in that area. We can also use multi-species or mixed species grazing. That can help clean the pastures. Horses do not share worms with sheep and goats and so horses or donkeys make good pasture vacuums. The sheep and goat worms do not hurt them and vice versa. So they make fairly good pasture vacuums. I've actually ruined a research project because I needed my sheep to be wormy, but I had grazed horses on the pasture for a few months before. So they had cleaned up all the worms and it, it took me a long time to get those sheep wormy again so we could do some, some studies with them. You don't have to mix them together though. So if you don't like having your cattle and your sheep and goats together, uh, like a, a friend of mine in Maryland didn't want his his show quality Herefords to be with the dairy goats. So the cattle would follow the sheep and goats or clean them up or go before and clean them up. And, and then the sheep and goats would have fewer parasites on the pasture. I will say though that Cattle do share some parasites with sheep and goats. It's a minor issue in general, unless you have a really bad parasite problem and you have a lot of young calves. So it's better for grazing mature animals, cows and older, older animals um, for cleaning up those pastures. When you multi-species graze, you also take advantage of different grazing behaviors. For example, when you look at diet selection, Cattle and horses prefer grasses over um, broadleaf weeds um, and do very little browsing. While goats, of course, do much more browsing than sheep, but sheep also do, can help clean up pastures of broadleafs. So goats are more like a deer when you look at their grazing preferences. This is just another graphical way to look at that and how horses and cattle prefer more low flat areas and sheep and goats more sloped areas and sheep more legumes than cattle and horses and, and goats more browse. We look at stocking rates, so making sure that we don't overstock is important. And this is a slide, these past three slides were from Dennis Hancock, who was the forage specialist at University of Georgia for a while and he's moved on to a different university now. But the stocking rate for two to two and a half acres with different pasture types for different species, cows alone, sheep, goats, and then cows plus goats. And there's benefits of cows and goats. Uh, goats can really clean up the pastures of brushy, brushy species and weeds. I had a, a colleague that he didn't like the goats until he realized they could clean the fence lines for him and then he didn't have to deal with the fence lines on the farm and all of a sudden he liked the goats again. So they can really help with those kind of things. They can be used for brush eradication and obviously your stocking rate will be much higher if you want to eradicate brush species. Obviously if you're trying to, trying to keep the browse around to use for nutritional purposes, you'll want to rotate the, that browse and you won't want to keep your stocking rate up that high. 
I tell people generally they always want to know what's a good stocking rate per acre. So I tell people three to five adults per acre of good pasture and start with that and modify as needed. The same thing if they're going to try browse. Browse is a forage management type scheme that we can use to help control parasites. If they have access to browse, they're less likely. If they're if they're eating above, you know, from shoulder height up and off the ground, they're less likely to get worms. And some people even plant browse species to allow for their animals to be eating off the ground. Obviously, we talked about goats being able to to clean up an area. This is eight days of goats on some forage and browse area eight days apart. And some of that browse is very nutritious. So we look at kudzu here. This is a, a photograph that was part of, a, again, a presentation from Dennis Hancock. And the kudzu values for energy, it has 55 to 60% TDN, total digestible nutrients, which is an estimate of energy, and 12 to 18% crude protein, depending on the stage of maturity, the, the season of growth. But even if you have that really nutritious browse, you're going to have to rotate or you could lose that forage, lose that, that feed stuff and also have erosion. Because if you're looking at an area like this, that forage really helps to keep the soil from sliding down and eroding and goats can and sheep, but goats, sheep will browse some. I've had cattle clean some fence lines out really well. But goats are, are really good at, at doing some of this, cleaning up of browse area, wooded areas, but you could have erosion problems if you, if you don't, um, don't manage that properly. I had a horticulturalist tell me one time that in order to rotate your browse and keep it living, a plant has to have at least 20% of the leaf on a, on a plant to on that individual plant to survive. So, and some species may need more leaves left, more green matter. So that means whatever they're eating the most of, you'll have to watch very carefully if you want to keep that around in the future. A forage species that is also beneficial for fighting parasites is Cerecia lispidiza. So it has high condensed tannins. So all tannins are not the same. There are specific condensed tannins that Cerecia lispidiza has. Most of that research has been done with AU Grazer, which is a specific variety of Cerecia lispidiza. And it's been shown to lower fecal egg counts for worms, as well as coccidia osis counts in the feces of sheep and goats. So it is readily eaten by goats and is eaten by sheep if they know what it is. So it's readily eaten by horses. Not a lot of research has been done on the impact of parasites in horses or cattle with Cerecia lispidiza, but they, they will readily eat it. Bird's foot and big trefoil and chicory also have some tannin. There is very little research, but there is some research showing that it may have some benefit for parasite control. Definitely a good stand of chicory can help with growth. There were some studies in Clemson, out of Clemson, I believe, that showed some really good growth on, on chicory, which is, in, which is theoretically a, a annual depending on where you're located um, geographically. But there actually is no silver bullet, not even Cerecia lespedeza. A lot of people really like Cerecia lespedeza. And it is very beneficial in an integrated parasite management program, but when fed in a, in a long-term situation, like eight weeks, 12 weeks, as the primary feed source in some of our studies, we saw lower average daily gain in goats and sheep fed that Cerecia lispidisa versus the Bermuda grass hay and there have been other studies that showed lower molybdenum, which is a, a mineral, in animals grazing long-term Cerecia lespedeza as the main feed source. Although it didn't get to deficient levels, it was something that was noted. 
So as we look at forages for nutritional management and nutritional management for parasite control, we know that animals that are really fed well and are in better body condition are better able to handle or fight off worms. So there's specific times when this is really, really important. And one of those is in late pregnancy when the animal needs higher energy and protein because the babies are growing really fast. And also this is getting close to the time when we're gonna have issues with the periparturant egg rise, which we talked about previously in one of our weekly webinars. And this just shows the energy requirements for this is goats because goats generally have higher requirements than sheep, but the pattern is very similar. So wean lambs and wean kids both have higher energy requirements. And so if you look at if a forage is able to meet those requirements at different stages, there's actually very few situations in which they're going to meet those requirements for young weaned animals for energy. For those in early lactation or yearlings, pasture in a vegetative state may meet those requirements and definitely for dry adult, dry does or ewes and adult animals. When we look at protein, we see something very similar. And this is uh, protein requirements and, and forages at different maturity levels as well. So, I would say that the protein requirements, and this is based on, again, goat requirements. We've seen that if you actually increase the amount of protein, especially if you use bypass or rumen undegradable protein sources, that that helps them to fight worms as well. So having a, a protein source at 30% above their requirement levels has been shown in research to help them fight off parasites. And these are some, these are some forage or browse, sorry, browse species that have been shown to have fairly high protein levels. And that was work done, I believe by Dr. John Lugenbull as shown in these past two graphs. So what we're, what we're saying here is that supplemental feeding on pasture can help them fight off worms if your pasture is not meeting their requirements already. You might say, well, if what happens if we don't meet their requirements? Because there are some people who are probably feeding and not meeting the requirements for certain production levels. And that's what we look at is what would happen if you don't meet their requirements? Well, they lose weight or don't gain, gain weight well. They have singles, they don't reproduce as well. And then in the case of fighting off parasites, they die. So if you don't meet requirements, that animal can't fight off worms, uh, can't handle worms when they get it, and they can be in a bad situation. To find, to determine if you are meeting their requirements and how well nutritionally they're doing and also help us with parasite control, we can look at body condition scoring. There are videos at Langston and other, you know, university sites and other educational pieces on how to do body condition scoring. So you can look that up, but basically we want them to stay between a two and a four on a scale of one being emaciated or a walking skeleton and five being obese. We want to try to keep them in that range um, for understanding that we're doing a good job with our nutritional and parasite control situations. So we talked a little bit about new pastures and planting annuals. So these are some, some annuals that you might could try. We talked about chicory, uh, millet, sorghum, and sun hemp are warm season pastures. Here's a picture of sun hemp. Goats especially do like sun hemp. Sheep will eat it. Sheep like also the sorghum sudan and millet. The cool season forages can also be beneficial to parasite control. And those would include small grains in our area, ryegrass, and then some clovers. And those will benefit because we're creating those new pastures or those clean pastures for as far as parasite control goes. We're also providing supplemental nutrition. 
if we have a really bad parasite issue, we could consider zero grazing or a hybrid system. So I saw this actually is a picture, this top picture is in Jamaica, um, where they were put inside at night before the dew fell and they were put out to graze when it dried off. This allows for those larva, if, there, if there's no moisture there, they don't migrate up the blades of black grass as high. Therefore, it helps to control parasites. If they're in a barn like this all the time or in a dry lot, and if they don't have access to grazing, then you're gonna have very few, if any, parasite problems. And we have seen some research to show that depending on your feed source, your hay source, this can be economically feasible. Obviously, if you're losing a lot of animals, it's more likely to be economically feasible if you can keep them alive. Pro Coccidia could be a problem if you're feeding them inside in an inside situation, so you just wanna make sure you have good sanitation when you do that. We suggest that you could maybe plant multiple plant species for pastures, maybe plant some browse. I gave some examples of those earlier. And Paisho at Tennessee State University has some, some publications on different things that she has tried and has tried some really different things, plants in the amaranth class, those kind of things. Things we might consider otherwise weeds and she has used those for goats and sheep. We want to manage our refugia, which are the parasites that haven't been exposed to dewormers by managing what animals that we deworm. We want to use targeted select treatment. And we want to manage our pastures so that those forages are high quality and really give them the nutrition that they need. We do that through soil testing, fertilizing and liming as needed, um, keeping it mowed or trimmed so it's in a vegetative state. And to practice weed control as needed. Obviously, if your sheep and goats are eating weeds, there may not be a whole lot that you need to worry about. I know we had some pastures that horse nettle was the only thing out there and horse nettle can be poisonous. So it was good that they, the sheep and the goats were not eating it, but you may have to consider weed control. Also making sure that what you have out there is nutritionally sound for the animals. So there may be some weeds, but they may not provide that animal the nutrition that they need or even much nutrition at all like broom sedge. There's some, there's some weeds that are not beneficial for, for animals. So we can also conduct uh, fecal egg counts so that we can determine if our pastures are infected, how infected our pastures are. And we talked about that in our second weekly worm webinar. We can use uh, Bioworma or the Nematophagus fungus Duddington flagrans, which helps to reduce pasture burdens by trapping larva in the poop so that it can't infect the animal, so it can't get out into the L3 stage, it can't infect other animals. And that is a, the, the spore is fed directly to the animal fresh every day. So you, you have to feed daily. I put a question mark because there's some research to look at every other day feeding and how effective that can be. And when you look at this fungus, it is available in the US now. It used to not be, but it is now. When we look at there's two products available, live mole, live mole with bioworma in it, which is a ready to feed mix. So it's, I think about 20% protein. Um, and that is fed at 0.8 ounces per day for a 50 pound animal, 1.6 ounces a day for a hundred pound animal. And we look at that, that is $9 a month for a 50 pound animal or about $18 a month for a hundred pound animal. And that, that is again a ready to feed mix. The bioworma product, which is a concentrated product, which means you have to mix it in to feed yourself, is three dollars a month for a 50 pound lamb or kid and and six dollars a month for a hundred pound ewe or doe. So those are not cost prohibitive in some situations. Um, so you can sign up. So again, there's no silver bullet. We want to use an integrative approach to 
pasture forage animal management. And we'll talk about genetic selection and we'll talk about dewormers in the next webinar. And there's some fact sheets available at the wormx.info site. So there are some questions that um, Susan and Dr. Brian answered in the chat. Okay. But um, one of those questions was, do these, all, do these also affect, so hemonchus affect alpacas? which they answered and told them yes. Um, but when, when rotating, how many animals on how much land for one to three days grazing rotation should they follow? For management intensive grazing, it's probably going to depend a lot on how much forage yield you have on that pasture. So they put quite a few on a small amount of land. I tried to answer that question a little bit in the in the chat box. Remember, if you're not even thinking about worms, the first thing you got to think about is are you meeting the nutritional requirements of the animals that are in there? And you can you can balance a ration on pasture much like you would balance it out of a out of a feed trough. I shared a a link to an article on grazing math where you figure out how much you have in there and how much you need, so you can actually balance a ration. You can go by the old standby thing of take half and leave half, but that's going to determine how many animals and how big an area. Uh, moving them every three days is, is based on the worms, but you also you have to balance parasite control with nutrition. So it's not a simple question to answer. You know, I wish I could give you a direct question answer, but I can't because it's going to depend on how many animals, what the nutritional requirements are. Are they lambs? Are they ewes? Are they goats? Are they kids? How many babies do they have? And what stage of lactation are they? And then what kind of forage production are you getting out of that given amount of land? So unfortunately, it's not, it's not a simple answer. I would say if you have a county extension agent that you can talk to, try to get them to come out, look at your, look at your land, try to give you an idea. Your local land grant institution may have somebody that can work with you on that. And you can use some basics based on cattle. If you look at animal units and you say that five to six sheep or goats make up an animal unit, then you can do those estimates and look at some cattle animal unit studies and determine kind of where to go from there. So if your local county extension people are mostly cattle people, they could still be very beneficial in helping you with your forages and pasture management situations. Also NRCS, they can sometimes be helpful as well. They maybe even provide some money to develop rotational grazing systems and watering systems. Mm -hmm. Natural Resource Conservation Service. Well, <clears throat> another question that they have, um, can Sirius LSP diesel be used as hay? And I I think Susan answered that to tell them that it could be used as both hay and um, um, pellets. Do you have any addition to that answer? So we've done some work with silage and silage was actually also effective. So yes, it's effective as a hay. Specifically, the research done has been with a U grazer though, which is a grazing tolerant variety. Um, another question that they had was, is there a chart comparison for Sirius LSPDs versus chicory? Do you have any charts that do that, that can show those comparisons? And if so, are you willing to share them? I, I don't have a chart like that. I, you know, you can make a chart like that. Obviously, there's been a whole lot of research done on Sirius LSPDs and sheep and goats. Uh, I've mostly seen more nutritional and growth studies out of chicory. I haven't seen myself parasite control studies with chicory. There's probably some out there, but I haven't been as convinced that the ones that I've read for parasite control for chicory. Nutritionally, yes, there were some out outstanding growth rates on some lambs and some steers being fed chicory out of Clemson, but I, I haven't seen a whole lot of convincing data on the on the parasite control aspect for chicory, but not saying it's not out there. I haven't seen it. I was going to say that uh, very frequently the places that are doing the research are different geographically. A lot of the chicory has been done in, in New Zealand or, or sure. 
and chicory tends to be grown, the research has been done a lot in the southeast, so very often the research is being looked at it in different places. Chicory is grazed quite extensively in New Zealand. It's an herb. It's, it's very nutritious. But but Nikki's right. I think it's a lot. So research, research is a lot more compelling. Uh, there's a plant in uh, Europe, San Juan, that, that they're looking at. So they're looking at, um, you know, anything with condensed tannins. But the, the data from Cerisia looks the, the most compelling. And, and there's just a, a lot of work that's been done by our members of our consortium, including Dr. Whitley. Um, Ohio State did a study with chicory. There used to be a West Virginia uh, research center in West Virginia that did some work with it as well. But there's not nearly as much condensed tannins in chicory or birch for tree fuel as there is West Bediza. I think chicory is a better forage plant from a nutritional standpoint. Um, so there's a question about bypass protein, and they would like to know um, what bypass protein do you recommend? And also, this was talking about um, to describe how, could you please describe how rumen undigestible protein and how that is important? Okay, so, so rumen undigestible protein is sometimes also called bypass proteins. Generally, your sources of bypass proteins that are the highest are in animal-based proteins like fish meal and those kind of things which some people don't like to use but there are bypass proteins in other plant in some plant-based protein sources even soybean meal has some bypass proteins so basically what happens is if proteins are bound in the rumen they are not available for digestion they go through to the abomasum, which is the part of the digestive tract, which then can allow for those proteins to become unbound and then digested in the small intestine. So that is where we get our highest level of protein digestion is basically in that first part of the small intestine and absorption, super important. So Basically, the rumen is going to, the rumen microbes are going to digest some of the proteins and use it for it for themselves, these, these rumen microbes in this big fermentation vat. And then the animal actually gets second use of the protein by digesting some of the, the microbes themselves. So if you can bypass the rumen and go directly to the abomasum, you can get a higher effective protein, higher effective protein level. You don't want it all to be bypassed though. So rumen undegradable, if it's really, really high, you don't want that because you are basically, when you're feeding a rumen it, which is sheep, goats, cattle, the ones with the four chambered stomach. Just a side note, llamas and alpacas are also ruminants. Then you are actually trying to feed their microbes. You're trying to keep their microbes happy. So we balance their diets for the microbes themselves. So you don't want to take away all the nutrition for the microbe, but you bypass protein is helpful in that it increases again that effective protein level in the diet. Um, again, you can look up bypass protein sources and there are publications which list out a whole bunch of different ones and we'll give you a list of the level of bypass proteins in those. And if you email me, I can, if you can't find it easily, email me and I'll, I'll give you a, an email example. But just increasing regular protein is also beneficial. There are some companies that may make some artificial proteins, uh, bypass proteins. But anyway, there's several different sources. And if you need more information, you can email me. So there's another question about, is there a um, temperature range when the L3 migrates to, migrates up the pasture? And that, we had said before, was 50, 50 degrees Fahrenheit to about 96 degrees Fahrenheit, anywhere within that range. So that was addressed last time. But they wanted to know if the larvae climbed the grass yesterday but were not eaten then grass was dried, does the larvae remain at the same height or, or does it move from where it is? 
So if 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 the if the dew dries off and it's gonna attach to the blades of grass, then it's not going to really move too far. It go, it's not gonna move down or up unless the dew is running downwards. Then it will probably go back down in the dew. Um, they also added in there if if mud um, hay. If they leave the hay um, to dry and then they bale it, how long will the larvae take before the larvae die in the hay? And I can put in the same similar idea. The longer you leave it to dry, the quicker the larvae is gonna die. And if you're gonna, if you dry your hay and then um, you actually bale it and put it up. Once it's, there's no moisture, the larvae is going to utilize all of its um, reserves. And at that point, it's going to dry out and die anyway. So it's going to die a lot quicker than normal. Do you have a good list of poisonous plants for sheep and goats, or do they naturally avoid poisonous plants? Um, it said that you mentioned horse nettle. Yeah, there are some others. Azaleas, the pitted fruit, some of your even forage grasses, if they are stressed in drought or after the first frost, can become toxic. So, you know, grazing manage is important for that. The pitted fruits, the like wild cherry, if the branches fall off and the the leaves wilt, then those wilted leaves are, are poisonous. So Generally, animals, generally, can't say 100%, but generally they'll avoid toxic plants unless they are forced to eat them. So there's, you're overstocking or not, they don't have anything else to eat. There are times, for example, only the wilted leaves of those, those pitted fruits are poisonous and so they generally don't know to avoid those. So it's better to take those out if at all possible. Just take those out of the pasture, clean them off the fence line, those kind of things. Um, but there are some lists out there of plants that are, are toxic to livestock. Um, one of these questions is, um, as far as browsing pastures, is there any information on the nutritional value of small trees or shrubs as found in a heavily wooded gut posture where worms would not be present. So I'm not sure if this is a relevant question, but they don't know if the, the, the browse would meet the nutrient requirement of the animals, even though it doesn't, since they, they can feed deer instead of having them get parasites on posture. Right, so we did talk about some of those. I listed some of those species by the, the graph and these, this, this a PowerPoint presentation will be posted online for, for you. and We'll email you the, the links. I listed some species that are nutritionally, that do, do have higher protein. And obviously that's going to change with the season and the maturity of that plant. You can test them if you want. So you can actually send in a forage sample and have the nutrient analysis done yourself if you if you can't find that information so there's a, a powerpoint presentation online that gives some nutrient calculations protein calcium and phosphorus on some of our some of those different browse species that are in heavily wooded areas there's several different publications that may have that and if you need the links to those again you can email me so these have higher protein. So mimosa, locust, black and honey locust, mulberry, privet, kudzu, greenbrier, trumpet creeper. These were just a few that that have been shown to have some higher protein levels. Okay. Um, there's another question that's talking about the, is there anything specific? Um, so this person says, is there a, a specific active charcoal or other products that you would recommend having on hand for toxic um, toxicity from plant ingestion? Not a specific recommendation, but activated charcoal is, it, you can keep that on hand um, for, in case you do have some toxicity issues. There are some that it wouldn't matter though. I mean, if you look at wilted cherry, 
they die really quickly from that. So you, it, it is good though to have it on hand and it's fairly easy to, to try to drench them with that. Um, better if you could tube them, but, but having something like that on hand is, is beneficial. Um, another question is, is there anything you can apply in your posture, in your posture or around water areas to help reduce the loads of Eumongus chondritis or the parasite load? Because the larvae are constantly developing at different rates and are, the pellets are constantly being deposited on the pasture at different times of the day even, much less the days. There's nothing that you can spray on the pasture that will kill everything in the in the manure. So if you, one research study looked at liquid nitrogen and as a fertilizer and the effect on drying out the, the larva that were on the pasture. And it did, but then a few hours later, we have some more larva that were hatching from the from the feces, so it, it only works for that little bit of time that there's no larvae that have exited the manure pad and gotten exposed. So specifically for areas around your waterers, if you keep that dry, that helps. But again, mostly for a pasture application, there's not really anything you can, you can do. Okay, another question that I have is, does every animal on a particular pasture need to be fed biowormer or just some? Yes, all of them. In order to clean up that pasture, when you follow de the biowormer guidelines, you deworm everybody, and then you feed it. And the, the idea behind that is that eventually, if they're not getting reinfected, the, animal, the worms and the animals would die and then they wouldn't be laying eggs and wouldn't get reinfected again. So you'd be cleaning up the pasture. In that case, it's especially important if you deworm all your animals and really try to use one from all three classes and really try to get rid of those, all that's left is resistant um, worms. You really want to make sure that you're trying to suppress those from reinfecting the animals and breeding more resistant populations. So it is important to feed all the animals in the group on that pasture. Okay. Um, another question that I saw here is, are there any good resources that they can use to identify, to, to identify poisonous plants within their herd or within their pasture? You know, you can call your local extension office or NRCS may be able to help you out. I don't know, but there there may also be apps that you take a picture and it tells you what plant that is. And then you can look up if that plant is poisonous. Uh, there are some resources that list these plants are poisonous um, to livestock. Another question that I, is cheap grass okay for guts? I was muted. I'm sorry. I don't think it's good for anybody. <laughs> uh, I don't. I know it's it's a it's a very obnoxious weed. It can cause problems because it's sharp. They generally won't eat it. it um, I mean, I don't know if you, I don't have goats. I have sheep, but um, my sheep won't eat it, and it's very invasive and very difficult to control, and can, it can cause problems. I don't know if goats will eat it, or but no, I'd get rid of it. Um, that is it for our questions. And thank you for coming to our um, webinar, our weekly um, parasite webinar. This webinar was a part of our weekly worm webinar series provided by Dr. Kwame Matthews from Delaware State University, Dr. Delia O'Brien from Virginia State University, Susan Shanian from University of Maryland Extension, Dr. Nikki Whitley from Fort Valley State University in Fort Valley, Georgia. If you have any questions about this or other webinars available, please contact us at the information provided here or visit www.wormx.info.